Hello, uh, welcome to another of my fireside chats in the Vita series. And in these particular uh, segments of the Vita series, I'm reviewing the Vitas, the professional Vitas of various mental health professionals in the family courts. Uh, my goal is to assist uh, the family law attorneys in their ability to read a Vita, a professional Vita, to determine where the relevant information is from the unrelevant information and how to potentially cross-examine uh, the mental health testimony and to assist uh, parents in also learning how to read a professional vita um, so they can acquire the competent professional services they're not overwhelmed with things that are irrelevant but they know where to look on vitas to find the relevant information um, and because a lot of the parents are representing pro se in the family courts uh, because it's so expensive to hire an attorney that they have to represent themselves and cross-examine mental health testimony. So um, my goal in this is to empower the parents to be able to acquire uh, professional competence and um, effective solutions from the mental health people and to um, for family law attorneys to be able to effectively serve their clients in cross-examining mental health testimony. To do that, I'm using examples from the professional field out here. Our Vitas are basically our calling card that, that talks about who we are. So I'm looking at the various Vitas of the professionals out here, I'm just reviewing them and sort of instructing on how to read a Vita, where is, where is the relevant and not so relevant information. Now, um, today in this particular Vita series, I'm going to be discussing the professional Vita of Dr. Stahl. He's a prominent forensic psychologist in the family courts and his beat is up on, on the website there over with the Frankel group. Um, and Dr. Stahl would probably be considered one of the top uh, forensic psychologists in the family courts. He's written two books, first edition, second edition with Dr. Simon, uh, one in 2013, one in 2020, uh, entitled Forensic Psychology Consultation in Child Custody Litigation, a Handbook for Work Product Review, Case Preparation, and Expert Testimony from the Ameri published by the American Bar Association. Uh, and so he's literally, with Dr. Simon, written the book on uh, forensic custody evaluations. The, uh, and one of the first things as we look at um, Dr. Stahl's Vita is right up at the top. He indicates he's a board certified in forensic psychology. Now, these are um, postgraduate uh, organizations that confer you know, uh, diplomat status, diplomate status on um, psychologists if you go through their program or something. The, the, I've never looked into them because I've never found it necessary. <laughs> That's kind of superfluous. It's more for documenting that you're kind of a special psychologist because you've got special training. I have special training. I don't necessarily need to document, but documenting credibility in the family courts is a motivation for the psychologists currently in the family courts because they're expert witnesses and credibility and all sorts of things. So he indicates he's been board certified in forensic psychology from these two organizations. Now at the end, I will, after we've reviewed Dr. Stahl's Vita, I will return to this issue again because I want to, if this Dr. Stahl is an example of what a board certified forensic psychologist is, and it, it makes me to a degree question um, what exactly the American board and the you know, forensic psychology and professional psychology are doing to certify their psychologists if, if, if this is an example of their product. Um, but to start with, in reviewing a forensic custody evalu evaluator, uh, I want to talk about what forensic custody evaluations are. So this, the New York Blue Ribbon Commission on Forensic Custody Evaluations conducted an independent review of what they are. Essentially, they are a, an experiment in service delivery uh, to the parents and children in the family courts. Uh, it's a new model that's been developed by Dr. Stahl, Dr. Simon, and their colleagues. Uh, it's a new model for service delivery that's unlike anything else in psychology. It's specifically related to the family courts. Um, and what the New York Blue Ribbon Commission found was that um, ultimately, 
the commission members agree that some New York judges order forensic evaluations too frequently and often place undue reliance upon them. Judges order forensic evaluations to provide relevant information regarding the best interests of the children, and some go far beyond an assessment of whether either party has a mental health condition that has affected their parental behavior. And this quote is, is important for noting what the court is seeking, what the court would like is uh, information about whether either party has a mental health condition that's affected their parental behavior. And that's not necessarily what they're getting from forensic custody evaluations. They're getting custody decisions and recommendations. We Doctors need to go back to being doctors. Um, I'm a clear advocate that clinical psychology needs to return and that forensic custody evaluations was a highly problematic practice. It's an experimental practice. It's a failed experiment in service delivery. They go on to say, the Blue Ribbon Commission, that in their analysis, evaluators may rely on principles and methodologies of dubious validity. In some custody cases, because of a lack of evidence or the inability of parties to pay for expensive challenges of an evaluation, <coughs> excuse me, defective reports can thus escape meaningful scrutiny and are often accepted by the court with potentially disastrous consequences for parents and children. And my role in the family courts, what I'm doing right now uh, in my career is I'm serving as a consultant, a second opinion consultant to a lot of these forensic custody evaluations. So I get to read them. I am the meaningful scrutiny of these evaluations. And for my position, being having access and reading these uh, reports that they're producing, I agree 100% with the findings of the New York Blue Ribbon Commission on forensic custody evaluations. They use dubious methodologies and principles of dubious validity. They produce defective reports that are potentially disastrous uh, for parents and children. Uh, in their analysis, uh, so by an 11 to 9 margin, a majority of the commission members favor elimination of forensic custody evaluations entirely, arguing that these reports are biased and harmful to children and lack scientific or legal value. At worst, evaluations can be dangerous, particularly in situations of domestic violence and child abuse. Again, I agree, uh, having read these reports. Uh, and so this is what forensic psychologists have produced. This is a work product. This is a review of this. These members reached the conclusion that the practice is beyond reform and that no amount of training for courts, forensic evaluators, or other court personnel will successfully uh, fix the bias, uh, inequity, and conflict of interest issues that exist within the system. The conflict of interest issues is a critical piece. Um, and we'll talk about that going forward. So let's take a look at the vita of Dr. Stahl, uh, who is a prominent forensic psychology, literally wrote the book published by the American Bar Association on conducting the evaluations that the Blue Ribbon Commission so harshly critiqued. He starts with a uh, background on his education, and that's typical for Vita. You present your education followed by your work experience and then publications and anything that, that follows after that. Dr. Stahl has a disorganized presentation of his Vita um, where he presents things out kind of out of order of importance and um, jumps around a lot, uh, repeats some things sometimes, uh, some constructs or uh, information on his Vita. But he starts with his educational background. The, the first thing to notice is he's got a doctorate degree in education, um, not clinical psychology. And he indicates he's a guidance counselor, basically, guidance and counseling. That's for working in the school system, uh, guidance counseling. Uh, that's not a clinical degree that he's got training in delusional thought disorders or in uh, necessarily treatment or psychotherapy, um, attachment, attachment pathology, trauma, any clinical diagnostic issues. He's over in this, basically been, has his education in the school system relative to guidance counseling of students. If you drop back a year earlier, in, um, he has a master's degree, or 10 years earlier, he's got a master's degree in clinical psychology 
out of Eastern Michigan University in 1973 and a bachelor's degree at a University of Michigan in psychology in 1972. So I graduated high school in 1972. So he's a little bit older than I am. What's notable, and this is what I recommend you do, is kind of try to put together the story of the person's life, you know, chronologically. And that's why it helps to have vitas that are somewhat chronologically organized. Uh, and so he starts at, he gets a doctor, a, ma um, a bachelor's degree out of uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, out of University of Michigan. Then a year later, he gets a master's degree in clinical psychology. That's a short master's degree, one year. Uh, so I wonder the quality or extent of a one-year master's program all of a sudden. And, and that's, what, 50 years ago, 70, 80, 90, 2003, 2013, 2023, 50 years ago. He got a master's degree in clinical psychology. Then 10 years later, he goes back and gets a doctorate degree in education. And now he finds himself in the family courts treating really complex family systems pathology involving narcissistic borderline dark personalities and uh, factitious disorders and persecutory delusions. It's pretty complex in the family courts. And his education seems a little off track for that. Um, then there's professional licensures. You can do that, and that's relevant to the family courts, I suppose, because the forensic psychologists in the family courts, if you work in the family courts, you're trying to bolster credibility. And so that's a lot what the VITA is trying to do. So his VITA is sort of tailored more for a forensic court presentation of his expertise rather than clinical practice. Uh, why would you need five degree, five licenses unless you're working in five states? which is, indicates sort of the cross-jurisdictional uh, nature of the family courts and working in the family courts uh, as an expert. Um, they've been temporary authorization in other, other number of other states. Uh, the licensing needs to be revisited relative to telehealth consultation and in the family courts uh, because it is cross-jurisdictional for a lot of the professionals, um, higher, higher level professionals uh, who testify in cases. So second opinions, typically. Um, so on my Vita, I you know have my California license. And I, I feel like if you're licensed in California or if you're like um, qualified to be practicing in any state, and that's probably true of Arizona, Michigan, and Hawaii, and they're, they're probably all pretty relevant. And there's a movement uh, for online therapy um, and telehealth to it's called SIPACT to where the licensing boards are recognizing each other's licenses. So hopefully we'll be moving away from this kind of thing. But this is a little bit out of order. We're, we're looking for his professional experience at this point. Now he, he talks about he's gotten a diplomat from the American Board of Forensic Psychology, American Board of Professional Psychology. So again, he's bolstering his credibility, but we're still kind of waiting for his work experience on things. Um, He's gotten awards uh, from the AFCC. Uh, so in 20, 2000, so 23 years ago, he got the President's Award from the AFCC. And then he got more recently from the Arizona chapter, he got a, an award for being an outstanding forensic psychologist. The AFCC, the Association of uh, Family and Conciliation Courts, is the professional organization for forensic psychologists and family law attorneys. I kind of see them as sort of an incestuous uh, thought bubble. <laughs> they kind of go around and around with their forensic custody evaluations, but it's a sort of a closed information system. Um, and then he reports on faculty positions. Again, I would kind of see this as a little bit out of order. I want to see what, what are you doing in the family courts? What is your primary position? I don't think he's primarily a faculty position at a university. But he presents those next. Um, and the important thing about teaching positions is both the quality of the institution that hired you, but, but also um, it shows the courses that you've taught. And that the courses are what's relevant because that show you have to know the material if you're going to teach the course. So if you're going to teach an, a course in psychotherapy, you know how the, you know what the curriculum is. You have to know it because you're going to be imparting that information plus answering questions, grading tests, all those sorts of things. So if you've taught the course at a master, at a graduate level, then you know the material. Uh, 
And so that's the relevance of this. So when we look at his faculty positions, he's taught at Arizona Summit Law School. Uh, I've never heard of that. I imagine this smaller scale law school. It's not like one of the major universities, uh, but it, it's a psychologist teaching at a law school and National Institute for Trial Advocacy. And he participated in their development of a curriculum for that. So he's very focused over on the court system and the legal system. Then his faculty, you know, for 2000 to present with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges in Reno, Nevada. So he's been there a long time teaching courses in a law school or National Council uh, in the family courts uh, and, and then the present National Judicial Council in Reno, Nevada. I'm not sure where he lives, but but that seems like an interesting uh, choice to be working in the family courts, both for a long period of time, teaching courses in domestic violence uh, and family law. And so again, though he's not teaching in psychotherapy, diagnosis, um, any area of psychology. And when I look at his Vita, I'm very struck that I'm not sure he wants to be a psychologist. I think he wants to be in the legal system somehow. And, and I'm not sure he's in the proper profession being a psychologist, given the, the nature of what I'm looking at from his work experience and things. Um, contrast to my Vita. Now, a PsyD Vita should not have faculty appointments because we give up the research curriculum and doctoral training for additional training in or coursework in um, diagnosis and treatment. So universities don't hire us because we don't have that research uh, educational background of PsyD. So we, you shouldn't see any, but I have a couple of teaching positions because I like teaching and I, I've done pretty much everything in my course of my career. Um, and so you can see the courses I've taught, though, are assessment and diagnosis, psychotherapy at a couple of different universities, psychology universities. So I'm teaching psychology courses, and I know the information for each one of those courses. I know the information. I've, I'm competent in it because I've had to teach the course in it. The, um, then he goes on to list court-related postgraduate education. And uh, that seems like very specific. And we, we're, we get like for licensure, every two-year license period, you need 18 units a year of continuing education. So 36 units in a two-year period. That's a lot of units. And to go back and pick out two from 2017 and 1994 to 2000 about custody evaluation that he was trained in those by the AFCC. Given his rest of his vita, that's pretty insubstantial. I'm not sure it's, it adds anything to know that he's had a couple of training courses in custody evaluations. Um, he's written a book on custody evaluations, so he's, he obviously knows what he's doing on those. Um, if, by contrast, you look at my vita, and I've got seminars in train uh, trauma and complex trauma and dialectic behavior therapy. So I'm more focused on the clinical kind of things. And these are the ones I put on my Vita um, to support that I know these domains of pathology. I've been trained in them. Um, so advanced master's program in the treatment of trauma, because that's what we're dealing with is trauma, complex trauma, and child abuse, allegations of child abuse. Bessel van der Kolk, another uh, trauma uh, training workshop. Dialectic behavior therapy, because that's the therapy I recommend be brought over here. Now, we don't have actual any therapies in the family courts because clinical psychologists haven't been here for 40 years. So you have no therapy over here. If you hear anybody say they do reunification therapy, there's no such thing. Ask them for a book on reunification therapy. There's no such thing. They're just making that stuff up. Um, and so, but we need therapy over here. So I'm recommending we bring over dialectic behavior therapy. It's going to need to be adapted because it's for borderline personalities, but it brings cognitive behavior therapy, which the cognitive will be useful for challenging irrational beliefs of the delusion. Behavior therapy is going to be good for applied behavioral analysis. You can tell authentic from inauthentic conflict. It brings mindfulness, which is going to be really helpful for the stress reduction um, involved in, in the child and, and helping the child develop self-authenticity. And then it works with borderline personality pathology. So it's strong enough to deal with the narcissistic borderline dark personalities we have in the family courts. So I recommend that be brought over and then adapted for court involved family conflict. But right now we don't have any therapy in the family courts and you can see that. So 
I'm not sure that Dr. Stahl even knows the treatment for the fam for the pathology in the family courts. You know, if, does he know dialectic behavior therapy? Does he know emotionally focused? Does he know attachment therapy? Does he know the treatments? And I'm not seeing that when we review his vita. Um, then I've taken trainings in emotionally focused therapy, which is a couples therapy with uh, based on the attachment literature, Edtronic and all, other things. Um, and that I think could also be adapted into the family courts. It's a little too soft for the personality pathology and child abuse pathology, but I think integrated with dialectic behavior therapy would be helpful. Um, and a, a training series of training seminars, only three days uh, at the Bowen Center uh, for study of the family. And Bowen's, uh, Murray Bowen is a prominent family systems therapist. Uh, and this particular one was on findings from the Cornell Estrangement and Reconciliation Project directly relevant to the family courts. So I'm getting additional training in uh, family systems kind of stuff. And so that's the type of thing. These are the type of uh, continuing education things that you'll want to see on Avita. Uh, and then Dr. Sain, or Dr. Stahl here goes into uh, his next position or from 20, 2009 to present, is a director of forensic programs at the Steve Frankel Group. And it, what it appears is this Frankel Group provides continuing education credits, and they've hired Dr. Stahl to head up their forensic program, their forensic continuing education. So he offers continuing education, he recruits other instructors for continuing education in forensic psychology and the conduct of forensic custody evaluations which the Blue Ribbon Commission so harshly critiqued. And then um, he's had, th this is again a kind of backwards presentation, but um, he has a year of, uh, on a panel of juvenile court evaluators, doesn't say where, and then for a period of time pre-2000, uh, you know, so 30 years ago, he worked in Santa Clara Juvenile Court as a, an evaluator. Those would seem to be subsumed under what he's doing as a forensic evaluator. I don't think they add anything. And the you know, first one, I even know where it is. I would probably just take those off as Vita. It's, he's got a substantial forensic psychology Vita. This, this, that doesn't, these positions don't add anything. The third entry down here on this slide is, is where he's worked. That, that is his substantial professional practice. He's been in private practice since the time he got his doctorate degree, doing custody evaluations, working as an expert witness and everything about custody evaluations. So that's what he's done for the past 30 years. And everything else is an offshoot of that, uh, it would seem. So uh, this this is his work experience. Okay, So he's been in private practice and then a director of the continuing education in forensic custody evaluations and a couple of lower level uh, positions. I would tend to just disregard those and say they're subsumed under his doctorate degree and his substantial practice and writing books by American Bar Association. So he's a forensic psych uh, psychologist who's been in private practice since his doctorate degree. Um, so that becomes the totality of his experience, as far as I can see, on his Vita. He has three entries. He's got a doctorate in education 40 years ago. and um, in guidance counseling and he got a year of clinical training 50 years ago and he's been in private practice doing custody evaluations ever since the experience i would just say is insubstantial uh, i'm not seeing any additional information comes from that and the faculty positions are over in the law school so they're still within that domain of forensic psychology so it, again it doesn't add anything about uh, what his expertise is He's granted he's an expert in for conducting forensic custody evaluations, uh, but the Blue Ribbon Commission recommended by an 11 to nine margin that uh, the favor the elimination of forensic custody evaluations entirely, arguing that these reports are biased and harmful to children and lack scientific or legal value. At worst, they can be dangerous, particularly in situations of domestic violence and child abuse. Yikes for Dr. Stahl because this is what he does for the last 40 years. And an independent review uh, is kind of harshly critical of his approach to, um, to service delivery and its consequences. 
the um, now by way of contrast to my vita and what a working vita and clinical psychologist looks like. Um, so I was a clinical director for an assessment and treatment center for kids age zero to five in foster care uh, through the Cal State San Bernardino and the Inst their Institute of Child Development and Family Relations. So one of the features about looking at a vita is who hired the person. And that gives you a relative status. Are they being hired by Stanford or are they being, you know, by Joe's Bar and Grill down the street? Uh, to do psychotherapy on the side. Who's who's hiring that person? Because that gives you an endorsement of their capabilities. What domain did they work in? What's the pathology they work with? Now, with pathology, um, with clinical psychologist, I say that the our educations prepare us to learn, but it's the pathology that teaches. And we learn the features of the pathology by assessing it, and we learn the core of the pathology by treating it. So it's actually the pathology that, that we learn from when we were engaged with it. And that's why you look for these work experience entries, because this will give you information about what domain of knowledge that mental health person has. What have they worked with? And so in this case, it's child abuse and trauma and attachment pathology. It's pretty much spot on to all three of those. Uh, and then prior to that, you know, some criminal chronologically going back prior to that, um, I was clinical director for the Feynman consulting group. Ken Feynman was a uh, world's foremost expert in juvenile fire setting behavior. And so department of justice and FEMA got a hold of him and said, can you help us develop a, an assessment protocol for the family courts, uh, regarding this juvenile pathology of fire setting, the courts needed to decide whether to put the child on a juvenile justice track? Is it arson kind of stuff? Or do they need mental health treatment? Is it a family problem or something going on? Um, and so that was the task for the Feynman Consulting Group is to come up with the assessment protocol. I was brought on for the assessment protocol stuff. I wasn't an expert in fire setting behavior. Ken was, but so I was an expert in developing an assessment uh, diagnostic protocol. Uh, for these kids in the family courts. So I have experience developing diagnostic assessments for a court-involved pathology. And I was hired by Department of Justice and FEMA to develop their model. So those are the type of thing you look at who hired the person and what did they do. Uh, and that gives you indications of their background. Prior to that, I was at a medical staff at Children's Hospital of Orange County, working on a project with uh, UCI, University of California, Irvine Child Development Institute specifically Jim Swanson there, that he's a grand high kahuna in ADHD. And on the early identification and treatment of ADHD in preschoolers. Now it's interesting, Jim, Jim Swanson, he's like a top expert, top grand high kahuna in ADHD. Uh, one of the principal sites for the MTA study in the 90s, the most um, the best randomized control study of a pathology ever conducted. He was one of the lead sites for that. Um, and, but he could not, he wanted to work um, in the pre preschoolers to get access to the um, plasticity of brain development. He wanted to retrain some attention networks, but he couldn't do that without early childhood mental health expertise because working zero to five is a very specific domain. You have to understand all sorts of brain stuff and, you know, language systems and cognitive systems and attachment systems and how they all interrelate. So you're not allowed to practice zero to five unless you have early childhood mental health expertise. So that's where he, their, their community partner, Jim got Chalk Children's Hospital as a community partner for this project of parent training in the county. And it was Chalk that then reached out to get the early childhood mental health expertise. That's what CHLA, Children's Hospital Los Angeles has. And so there I got recruited over to, to work on this project because of my early childhood background. That shows on clinical psychology, how serious we treat competence. That Jim Swanson knows everything there is to know about ADHD, but he, he's not gonna work zero to, he's not gonna work with preschoolers with ADHD unless he has zero to five competence in that. In clinical psychology, we take competence very seriously. Um, and it just being with his project produces big old research uh, thing, a lot of authors. Uh, so, and the reason I'm fourth author on this is because I ran the project. So if you want to know what I did, you can read the article, and that's what I ran. Uh, Leanne Tam was my colleague, uh, UCI side, I'm chalk side, 
she wrote the article. She's first author, Jim Swanson second. Mark Lerner is the medical director at, Chalk, or at UCI, uh, Child Development Center. So he's third author. I ran the project, I'm fourth. Patterson and Lakes were my postdocs at, at Chalk. So I, kind of, I supervise them. Millie Kudo ran the uh, childcare team. So we had all these childcare workers and getting them out to locations and paying them and stuff. And so she ran that. Wendy Altamarino ran the parent trainer team. And so she kind of wrangled all the parent trainers. We, we were doing parent training throughout the county out of community locations using this approach by Chuck Cunningham that you see at the bottom here called the COPE method that involves small group discussion and Socratic questioning. Um, and so Wendy managed all of them and I trained the parenting coordinators. Rosa was the Spanish language coordinator for the parent training people. So she met, wrangled all the Spanish language parent trainers. Um, and then I worked with Rosa. Um, John Watkins was head of the chalk psychology department. So that's his position. Steve Simpson, I just want to note him because he was a, a psychologist who worked with Jim Swanson on the MTA study. So I was working with the MTA team when I was over there. Um, and he is the best behavioral psychologist I've ever worked with. He was just phenomenal on that. And so I just want to note him for his quality of his behavioral psychology. Um, and the service before diagnosis, I think that can be brought over in the family courts extremely well. Um, because we know it's borderline dark personality, narcissistic borderline dark personality that's coming into the family courts. We know we're concerned about a shared persecutory delusion. We can actually do interventions for that before we get the diagnosis. Um, but nobody listens to me right now. Um, and it produced an article in clinical neuroscience research just by being around Jim. Um, and, and again, you see a bunch of interactive people. I'm working on a project with a number of people towards a, as opposed to individual private practice. And so that's the, the difference. And the, over here with, um, with the pediatric psychologist, I'm working on a treatment team. I'm the pediatric psychologist on a treatment team for a kid with cancer or kids with spina bifida. So we've got medical professionals leading the treatment team. We've got physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, uh, nursing staff, all these various people to work as part of a treatment team. When I'm working clinical director of the children's society, I'm working as part of a treatment team uh, of the CPS social worker and the foster parents and the individual therapists and the family therapists. And it's part of a treatment team. We actually had the, the treatment team uh, meetings at our clinic conference room because it's a nice conference room. So uh, the CPS social worker, they'd send a social worker over. We get the foster parent. We get, I have my individual therapist and family therapist from our clinic, um, teachers sometimes, and um, who, the relevant people on the treatment team. So I've been working treatment teams uh, throughout my career. As when you look at Dr. Stahl, he's been in solo individual practice, not working with anybody, developing this new experimental approach to service delivery. Um, I'm wondering who, who provided the oversight and review of what he's doing. Um, and even here, working with, I'm working with several other psychologists, Dr. Feynman, Dr. Patterson, and myself, the firefighter in the Orange County Fire Authority. So we had four people working as part of a team to develop the assessment protocol. Um, article, and, and then before that, I was at, uh, UCLA, uh, working on a longitudinal research project uh, with Keith Nectarline, who's considered like the top expert in schizophrenia. I uh, was there for 12, 13 years, being trained annually in the diagnostic assessment of delusional thought disorders and psychotic pathology. So that's my background in that. So again, you're looking at where the person worked and who hired them. Um, so I've got UCLA, Chalk, UCI, FEMA, Department of Justice, uh, Cal State San Bernardino and working with trauma and ADHD and schizophrenia. So I have a broad base and developing assessment protocols. Those are the type of things you're looking at Avita for. What domain, who hired the person, um, and the domain will indicate their field of competence. And before that, um, going back, I was a research associate uh, for a year with Dr. Dykins at UCLA and who's on William Cinder. 
Williams syndrome, which is a genetic deficit defect. And then the control group was Pratt or Willie syndrome, which is also a genetic uh, problem. And so I even have these small pockets of experience as well. Then for that, I worked at various psychiatric hospitals uh, across Southern California. That's how I put myself through my master's program is working in psych hospitals, take courses during the day and go get the evening shift at the psych hospital. And then uh, I started off my training when I was an undergrad at UCLA, uh, working for the telephone crisis counselor for the Suicide Prevention Center in Los Angeles, and then rose up to shift supervisor for the Suicide Prevention Center. So I know risk assessment. I know, you know what we're supposed to do with dangerous pathologies. And I know psychiatric pathologies and uh, you know, that domain of things. Um, and so that's, that's a clinical Vita. You can see the domains and the breadth of clinical experience as composed to the forensic Vita that he does one thing, forensic custody evaluations, and he hasn't worked with any other type of pathology or in any other type of context. Um, this is the entirety of his Vita, as far as I can see, in terms of substance. He has a doctorate degree in education, not even clinical psychology. He has a year of clinical training, and, and he's been in private practice for 40 years developing this new approach to service delivery with his colleagues. And again, I'm wondering who oversaw that, who, who was looking, because of once we get independent review of a New York Blue Ribbon Commission, they harshly critiqued it. And when I'm reading these things, they are extremely problematic, these custody evaluations that he's developing and advocating and teaching about. Then he lists a bunch of uh, witness testimony things. Um, you know, yeah, you're an expert witness in the family courts, you've testified. Again, it appears he's, he's trying to bolster his credibility for presentation to the court, that he's an expert. And so therefore we need to, um, or we should be uh, listening to his opinions. Uh, and so he's testified a lot of things. Again, I don't see this as adding substance to anything um, or in additional information. He, he notes then one clinical experience from 1973, 50 years ago to 2004, that where he worked with social service agencies and residential treatment centers uh, in California, Michigan, and things. So I'm not sure quite what that that is, but it, it it's kind of a low level position working social service agencies. That's what I did with you know clinical director for kids in foster care, We're getting paid by the Department of Mental Health County and referral sources, CPS. So I know working county kinds of things in residential treatment centers. I worked at adolescent psych hospitals and things early on. So I, I know what those are. And those are kind of lower level clinical experiences um, 30, 50 years ago. Um, then he put through, he's done some keynote presentations uh, on things. The uh, I find this one interesting. You know, the, all the presentations are not so substantial. They they indicate the person had opinions, but typically it's it's trying to bolster your vita, show what you know by what you've taught, basically. So I've taught these courses, but they're not actually courses or seminar presentations. And so he's done a lot of teaching about uh, forensic custody evaluations. He has a lot of opinions about forensic custody evaluations. I'm not sure they're accurate. I would cite to the Blue Ribbon Commission that his opinions are actually problematic and dangerous and harmful to children, lack scientific and legal value. Uh, by the way, I'm willing to debate this anytime in any forum. Online moderated debate, you know, the role of forensic versus clinical psychology in the family courts. I, Dr. Simon and Stahl, uh, harshly critique clinical mindset. They say it's inadequate and inappropriate and the forensic mindset is better in chapter two of their books. I disagree with that as a clinical psychologist. I think Clinical mindset is uh, essential and the forensic psychology mindset that they're advocating is highly problematic. So let's debate it. Um, I'm good. I'm good for that. Let's get an online moderated debate. Um, but I noticed, he, you know, this one entry where it was invited co-panelist at the CLE, the legal uh, continuing education units and ski meeting of the bar at Snowmass, Colorado. That sounds nice. Going to you know be on a panel in Colorado and go skiing and things and that sounds like a, a nice career he he's developed in forensic psychology. Meanwhile, I'm in the family courts with active 
child abuse and active spousal abuse, undiagnosed and untreated. And I'm not sensing the urgency or even the realization from Dr. Stahl's vita that he understands the nature of the pathology. In addition, I'm working with the complex trauma of the targeted parents, their traumatic grief of having lost their child in their lives because of forensic custody evaluations. And so I'm treating the trauma and traumatic grief being caused by forensic custody evaluators with their defective reports. Um, and meanwhile, he's going skiing and teaching about forensic custody evaluations. I wish he would stop traumatizing the parents so I could stop treating their complex trauma. Um, he's a provider of continuing education. Uh, this isn't really presentations. He indicates he can deliver continuing education credits for the, his talks from 1995, 2018, quite a period from the Bar Association. And then 95 to 2010, he was authorized by APA to give out continuing education credit. Again, I'm not seeing anything that bolsters his knowledge, knowledge about anything. Um, it's procedural. He can bestow continuing education credits on people. Um, judicial instruction in forensic psychology. So again, it's not through university or something. So it's not coursework and diagnosis or treatment. So he's teaching judges about custody evaluations that this experimental new approach he's developed. Um, and since 1996, so for parents who are saying, oh, we need to teach judges about the pathology. We need judicial education. He's been doing this in 1996. Look at his beta. He's got a whole bunch of entries about how he's been teaching um, the courts about custody evaluations. So has it solved anything? No. We still have a nightmare mess in the family courts. It's not solved and people are still trying to figure out how to solve it. Um, and so what's he teaching the judges if it's not effective in doing things? Um, and he's trained internationally, Singapore, Australia, and similar topics. Um, is it helping? Australia, how, how are things going for you on that? Has he solved things with those presentations? Um, and I would refer cite back to the Blue Ribbon Commission that found what he's teaching, uh, these how to do custody evaluations and things are of dubious validity. They've produced effective reports, but potentially disastrous consequences that are harmful to children, that these forensic custody evaluations lack scientific or legal value, that they can be dangerous, and that the practice is beyond reform. I mean, this is the Blue Ribbon Commission independent review of what they're doing. So who's giving oversight to these forensic psychologists and coming up with their new experimental approach to service delivery. Now we finally get it and we, we get a pretty harsh critique. The problem I have with the experimental service delivery is that they never informed the public or the courts of alternatives. So if you're gonna do an experiment on people and that's what this is, a new approach um, that doesn't diagnose or treat pathology but makes custody decisions, that's not the role of a doctor. They, they left the role of a doctor, diagnosis and treatment, and became mini judges kind of thing in the family courts. And you can see he's teaching in law schools. Um, and the problem is they didn't tell the public or the court about alternatives to their experimental treatment, which would be the clinical diagnostic assessment that can be returned for about 2,000, 2,500 to maybe 5,000 with a second opinion in four to six weeks. Whereas their custody evaluations take six to nine months, cost tens of thousands of dollars, and don't even diagnose the pathology. So we still need another assessment to get a diagnosis so we know what to do for treatment. Diagnosis kind of treatment. Treatment for cancer is different than the treatment for diabetes. And so we still need another assessment even after this. And and But they didn't tell them, the courts about that. There's your conflict of interest. And what happens when we return to clinical psychology and start treating and fixing the pathology? They're going to advocate against that because their entire career disappears. What's, what's Dr. Stahl going to do once we eliminate forensic custody evaluations from the family courts? That's the only thing he's ever done. He's, not, he's going to have to go work with ADHD or autism. He's going to have to get an entry-level position working at a clinic on ADHD, and he's like a couple of years older than I am. So yeah, to the extent that he's in a position of power or influence, he's going to be working against solving anything that does not involve the custody evaluation. So there's your conflict of interest that's problematic. Um, Blue Ribbon Commission says, let's get rid of them. 11 to 9 margin, uh, elimination of forensic custody evaluations entirely because they're harmful to children, 
lack scientific or legal value or dangerous. Uh, what, I'm willing to debate this with Dr. Stahl, Dr. Simon, any forensic psychologist, anytime. Um, I agree with the Blue Ribbon Commission. We need to get rid of them. They're highly problematic. Clinical psychology needs to come back. Clinical psychology hasn't been in 40 years. We need to adapt DBT. We need to, to get a handle on this situation. And that the practice is beyond reform and that no amount of training for courts, forensic evaluators, and or other court per personnel will successfully fix the bias, inequity, and conflict of interest issues that exist within the system. And so he's out there teaching all of these courses in Australia and, you know, CLE units and University of Reno and stuff, um, law school. But the, the, what he's teaching is a practice that's beyond reform uh, and no amount of training is going to be helpful. That's a pretty harsh critique of what he's doing and I'll happily deb debate it any time. For forensic psychologists, I'll call scoreboard on them. And that's a that's a sports guy thing when you know your buddy is yapping about the loss in the game and oh we got a bad call and he dropped the pass if he only caught the pass all the woulda coulda shoulda stuff and when you're tired of it and you wanted to shut it down you just look at him and go scoreboard which means look at the scoreboard who won who lost okay so i'm going to call scoreboard on forensic psychology 40 years this is what they've given us in the family courts we're for a nightmare in the family courts it's awful over here uh the courts aren't happy the parents aren't happy there's undiagnosed, untreated child abuse. There's undiagnosed, untreated spousal abuse. It's an absolute mess. It's way expensive. The children's lives are destroyed. We're not fixing anything. We're not fixing or bearing relationships. It's a nightmare. And this is the product of 40 years of forensic custody evaluation. So I'm going to say it's 40 years of failure is enough. They've had their experimental approach and it's been reviewed by New York Blue Ribbon Commission. You're done. Um, it's a failed model it's of uh, service delivery to a vulnerable population. Um, and if they get all the benefits, I think they should hold the responsibility for the failure of their approach that they develop. Then he lists four pages of publications. There's, it's, the publications are all, his publications are all opinion pieces or not research. And opinion pieces don't matter. They, they, they're, you have an opinion. Even if it's a peer-reviewed opinion, that means you just found QAnon, you know, and you have a QAnon opinion, and it's published in the QAnon journal, so it's a peer-reviewed journal on conspiracy beliefs or something. Just because you have an opinion and it's peer-reviewed doesn't make the, peer, the opinion accurate. What we're looking for in publications is research, because that gives an indication of where your expertise is. If you're Doing research on attachment, and you know attachment. Dorsey Pruder has got a, a research project, custody resolution method, um, content analysis using a methodology called data coding or data tagging. She's got a, a research project um, on all the text messages, emails, um, court documents, um, reports, everything, and she tags it up into various contents of stuff. That indicates that she knows the pathology in the in the family courts because she's looking at the data. She's dealing day to day with the data. So that's where research is important. So if we've got research in schizophrenia, that person knows schizophrenia really well because they're dealing with the actual data as it's coming off the schizophrenic patient. Opinion pieces are relevant. Where's the research? And then the research will tell you what the domain of the um, competence is. There's no research. so. Pages of publications are irrelevant. Um, judicial conference, seminar, workshop presentations. This is kind of redundant. He's done a lot of presentations and lists a bunch of presentations. Um, but he's done presentations in North America, Hong Kong, New Zealand, London, Stockholm, Singapore, South Africa, and Australia on topics such as forensic psychologies um, and custody evaluations. I would then say, hey, um, Australia, New England. You know, um, North America, uh, yeah, uh, how's things going for you guys? Everything fixed over there? You know, Stockholm, uh, Sweden, everything fixed in your family courts? Because he's been over there teaching this stuff. It should be if he knows what he's doing, if he's got solutions for you. Um, I'll note, by contrast, again, my Vita shouldn't have any research on it because I'm a PsyD, not a PhD. I'm not in university. I got two research projects both with Dorsey Pruder, who I mentioned before. She's a businesswoman and family coach in the family courts. She's probably the most experienced professional in the family courts because she's not only recovering children with iRoad workshops, she's got research protocol where she's doing data coding and 
content analysis of all the data surrounding these families. Um, so she's got her finger right on the actual pulse of what's happening in the family courts. Um, and so, but she's also got two research, different types of methodology. Um, one with Greenham Childress and Pruder that's up on ResearchGate about the dark personalities and delusional disorders. That's looking at the 12 associated clinical signs that I identify. And they're present and they're present in sub substantial numbers of substantial percentages in the families. Uh, 46 families in the family courts. All 46 families had the three diagnostic indicators. And then this research looks at how many of the associated clinical signs each of the families have. That's the scientific method. You have a model, you make a prediction, you look at the data, and if the data supports the prediction, then that model's accurate that made the prediction. So everything I'm saying about the pathology is true and correct, and I'll cite to Greenham, Childers, and Pruder that's up on ResearchGate and is moving it through the publication tubes. Um, and then I've got another um, presentation to the American the National Convention of the American Psychological Association with Dorsey back in 2019 on her high road workshop which can recover kids from serious pathology within a matter of days, from this complex trauma and psychological abuse within a matter of days. And so she's got single case ABA data research on the high road, and she's got content analysis data coding research on all the data surrounding these conflict families. So she's she's probably got the strongest uh, research feeda. And if you're looking at publications, that's, you're looking at research. So she's got the strongest research vita. She's got the strongest vita in the family courts, I think. Um, I, I I would challenge on her on that a little bit because I've got research as well, but it's with her. So um, yeah. And I got a psych degree, so you kind of do a little bit different. Um, but here's her, her single case ABA research. And so this is uh, three phases of intervention. So the A phase is no intervention, the B phase is intervention, and the A phase is no intervention again. The intervention is the high road workshop. So that's out of Dorsey Pruder. It's a four-day workshop. In this particular case, she modified it to two days because she didn't only have two days. Um, so how good she is, she can take a four-day recovery from three years of child abuse. Um, and she can recover in four days. Oh, I only have two days. Okay, I'll do it in two days. Um, and it also shows how easy this is to recover when you have the proper context it required a protective separation. That's the issue because no therapy or no treatment or intervention for child abuse is going to be effective as long as we're sending the kid home to be an abusive parent, to be abused again. We need that protective separation period to work with child abuse, to resolve child abuse. And, and so once you get that and you can do, add the high road protocol to start that, look what happens. So the B phase is two days of the high road. Look, the kid went on three items, affection, cooperation, social involvement, one to seven scale rated by the targeted parent. So you know the targeted parent's going to be truthful. If the child's not doing well, they're going to tell you the child's not doing. But the, based on what the targeted parent's saying, in two days, the child went from ones and twos to fives and sixes. In two days, he went from awful to wonderful. In two days of the high road workshop, documented, there it is, by the parent. And then I came on, I'm the second A phase, I'm the follow-up um, therapist, uh, my maintenance care therapist uh, is what she calls him. I, I was a maintenance care therapist. And that's pretty much what I had to do. I didn't have to recover the child. He was already recovered. He was doing fine. It's one of the easiest therapies I've ever had. Look at that. He, he comes in, normal range, and I just kind of help regage things and settle things out and rebond with the mom. Um, and those are all my numbers or all the therapy stuff I did. But look at that rise on the B phase, two days. And we had a documented child abuse by three separate mental health people, all documented child abuse. The court did nothing for three years. Of court. Three mental health people are telling the court there's child abuse by the dad, nothing for three years. Finally, the court gave a protective separation. Boom, Dorsey's got him recovered in two days. Unbelievable. So... That also speaks with Dr. Stahl relative, and all forensic psychologists, relative to maintaining competence. Psychologists undertake ongoing efforts to develop and maintain their competence. Um, and I would say if you're not consulting with Dorsey Pruder, who's got a four-day workshop that recovers it, she got a trauma-informed parenting course for the targeted parents that I think is effective and wonderful. I refer to it all the time. 
And she's got a custody resolution method, which is a research project that, uh, you know, is far surpasses anything that the forensic psychologists are doing. That's actual data on the family courts. She knows this pathology really well. She's been here over 15 years solving the pathology. If the psychologists aren't consulting with her, they're ignorant and I would argue unethical for failing to maintain their competence by not consulting with them. Then we have, you list a number of professional memberships. Again, that's sort of endorsement by membership uh, that, you know, where do you work? What pathologies have you worked with? Joining an organization doesn't show that you're competent in anything. It just shows you joined an organization. And look, at he's all American Bar and AFCC stuff. So he's, again, what I would consider very thin. In forensic psychology, he doesn't do anything else. What's going to happen if and when forensic psychology leaves and we stop doing that? What happens to his career? He's been on editorial review boards for forensic psychology. Um, so again, uh, very thin. Um, they were special issues, so they're not full on. Leslie Droid there is a was the editor, it seems, of that crusty journal. Um, and I might look at her beta going forward. I know I've run across one of her reports, looked at that before. Um, and then he's he's been on the board of directors for the Association of Family and Conciliation Court Scholarship Committee and various board of directors for various um, forensic psychology, AFCC sorts of stuff. And I was struck by that because I'm also a, a board on the board of directors for an organization, Bayfront Youth and Family Services. It's a um, organization that helps with the treatment of kids in foster care and kids in trouble, helps support them around school and therapy and recovery and stuff. Um, it's a great organization. Um, and But now I've always, for the last 10 years, I've been on the board of directors, chairman of the board for Bayfront, but I haven't put them on my beta and I've never talked about them because I want to protect them from retaliation. I want to protect my kids over here on the pay front and the organization from getting attacked by the flying monkeys in the family courts uh, who want to damage me and so will attack anything associated with me, which shows you how dangerous it is for a clinical psychologist in the family courts. That's kind of like, you know, the girlfriend of Spider-Man. Uh, you know, if you're the girlfriend of Spider-Man, you're going to get abducted. So I've got to keep you secret so that Bayfront isn't attacked. Uh, foster care, helping kids in foster care might get attacked by the pathology over here as a way to damage me. And so when I'm looking at Dr. Stahl's Vita and how he kind of nonchalantly moving through being a friend, it's not a danger to him being in the family courts because he's protected for some reason, um, because he's a forensic psychologist and there's conflict of interest issues. Uh, surrounding licensing boards on that. So they're protected. Um, meanwhile, the clinical psychologists out here, it's extraordinarily dangerous. Dorsey, it's extraordinarily dangerous for her over the course of her career. Where's the forensic psychologist helping out with these things? Oh, but one of the things I put up on Bayfront is I put their donation link um, because now I think they're safe. I don't think anybody's gonna attack them to try to get at me. So now I can start to say, hey, um, and, so I just wanted to note them and say, if you're like Dr. Childress, if you like what I'm doing in family courts, you appreciate this stuff, consider donating to, to Bayfront as a way of saying thank you to me. Um, you know, these are kids who need help and they're kind of our forgotten kids. And, and so it, it helps. Um, so consider that there's your public service announcement in the midst of my, my presentation here. Um, Cross-examining forensic testimony. So let's get into that for a second. Uh, here's the totality of Dr. Stahl's Vita as far as I can see. And so that's a very thin Vita. Um, education, one-year clinical training, private practice. And where I think this Vita is vulnerable is on the boundary 2.01 boundaries of competence. Psychologists provide services, teach, and conduct research with populations and in areas only within the boundaries of their competence based on their education, training, supervised experience, consultation, study, or professional experience. Dr. Stahl would likely um, say that he is experienced in education, training, experience in family courts. I would argue that he's not experienced and trained in delusional thought disorders, attachment pathology, child abuse and complex trauma, or family systems, which is what the pathology is. 
So from a clinical psychologist's perspective, I don't see he's competent with the pathology. Now he says, I'm a forensic psychologist, so I'm not subject to competent standards of clinical psychologists, but yes, you are, because you're licensed as a clinical psychologist. You're not licensed as a forensic. That's a subspecialty domain. So you have to at least meet the domain standards of clinical, and then you can add forensic requirements, but you can't take away ethical requirements of, that are of clinical psychologists for competence. You're working with a delusional thought disorder, attachment pathology, and child abuse. You need to be competent in that. This is clearly a pathology, attachment pathology because child rejecting a parent is a problem in love and bonding. That's the attachment system. So to work with attachment pathology, child rejecting a parent, you have to be competent 2.01 in the diagnostic assessment and treatment of attachment pathology. Same with child abuse. This is potentially child abuse by one parent or the other. I got at least one parent making child abuse allegations, the allied parent against the targeted one. Targeted parents saying the allied parents psychologically abusing the child, shared delusion, practice. So we got child abuse. So that's clearly relevant um, to the pathology in the family court. So you need to be competent in that based on your education, training, and experience. Delusional thought disorders, Walters and Friedlander in the journal Family Court Review. This is the flagship journal of the AFCC. And so in their own forensic journal, other forensic psychologists are acknowledging that this is a potential delusional thought disorder. So you have to be competent in the diagnostic assessment of delusional thought disorders based on your uh, education, training, and experience. You need to see it on your vita. So in some RRD families, resist, refuse dynamic, a parent's underlying encapsulated delusion about the other parent is at the root of the intractability. Uh, that an encapsulated delusion is a fixed circumscribed belief that persists over time and is not altered by evidence of the inaccuracy of the belief. It's a fixed and false belief maintained as by contrary evidence. That's the phrase. It's not Dr. Childers. You can just use that. It's a fixed and false belief maintained as by contrary evidence. So, but they note in this particular quote twice, they note that it's a potential delusion. They go on to state when alienation, they like making stuff up. When alienation is the predominant factor in resist, refuse dynamic, another made up thing. Um, the theme of the favored parents fixed delusion Often is that the rejected parent is sexually, physically, and or emotionally abusing the child. The child may come to share the parent's encapsulated delusion and regard the belief as his or her own. So we know it's a possible delusion. So now all forensic custody evaluators need to be competent in the diagnostic assessment of delusional thought disorders based on their education, training, and experience, which means you should be able to see it on their vita. So cross-examining mental health testimony. I would... My standard opening recommendation to start with is the AP Ethics Code mandatory or optional. It's mandatory. Um, read standard 2.01, boundaries of competence. Do you agree with it? Yes. Do you abide by it? Interesting question. They'll say yes. Why is standard 2.01 important? What bad things would happen if it was violated? Basically, if you're not competent, you're going to misdiagnose the pathology. You're going to wind up mistreating the pathology. If you believe a shared delusion, you become part of the shared delusion, you become part of the pathology. When that pathology is child abuse, you become part of the child abuse, you become a child abuser. So if they misdiagnose a shared delusion, these forensic psychologists are going to become participants in the child abuse. Wow, holy cow. So it's really important they get an accurate diagnosis, and I'm not sure they even know how to diagnose or what a delusional thought disorder is. So that's kind of a problem. So my questions, once you get them to kind of tell you what, why it's important to be competent, is to ask them, show us on your veto where you acquired your professional training and experience in the diagnostic assessment of delusional thought disorders. Show us on your veto where you acquired your professional training uh, and experience in the diagnostic assessment of attachment pathology. And show us on your veto where you have your uh, training and experience in the diagnostic assessment of child abuse and complex trauma. All three of those, I think, would be interesting questions for Dr. Stahl. It'd be interesting to see how he answers, because I'm not seeing any competence in any of those three domains. So from a clinical psychologist's perspective, he's not competent with the pathology. From a forensic psychologist, he's worked in the family courts, um, but I have concerns as a clinical psychologist. Ignorance and indolence, uh, 40 years of failure. Uh, so 
The pathology in the family courts is undiagnosed and untreated child abuse. It's a shared induced persecutory delusion and false factitious attachment pathology imposed on the child by a pathological narcissist borderline dark parent. A DSM-5 diagnosis of V995.51. The pathology in the family courts is the brutal and savage undiagnosed and untreated spousal abuse of the targeted parent using the child as a weapon, a DSM diagnosis of V995.82. Based on my review of Dr. Stahl's Vita, he does not appear to appreciate the urgency of the clinical pathology he's working with, which uh, raises concerns that he's not competent in the clinical pathology and he's working with severe clinical pathology. So I have concerns uh, based on my review of his Vita. I also have ethical concerns and it's mandatory, it's required. When psychologists believe there may have been an ethical violation by another psychologist, they attempt to resolve the issue by bringing it to the attention of that individual if an informal resolution appears appropriate and the intervention does not violate confidentiality rights. And well, that's mandatory for me. And I believe there may have been an ethical violation because of standard 2.01 relative to the diagnostic assessment of delusional thought disorders, the diagnostic assessment of child abuse and complex trauma, and diagnostic assessment of attachment pathology. I'm not seeing on his veto where he has the necessary education, training, and experience to be working with the clinical pathology he's working with. Um, you can work in the family courts doing this experimental new approach to service delivery of custody evaluations that he's and his colleagues have made up. But, and that's been so harshly critiqued by the Blue Ribbon Commission on forensic custody evaluations, uh, but I'm not seeing actual uh, clinical knowledge of what the pathology is. And then I'm worried about 2.04, uh, basis for scientific and professional judgments. Psychologist work is based on the established scientific and professional knowledge of the discipline, and that knowledge is attachment, family systems, personality disorders, child abuse and complex trauma, DSM-5 diagnostic system. I'm not seeing where he applies that knowledge because I'm not seeing where he acquired that knowledge. Um, so I'm worried about standard 2.04 as well, that he doesn't know the knowledge and he doesn't apply the knowledge because he doesn't know the knowledge. Uh, and then I'm worried about 2.03, that he has not undertaken ongoing efforts to develop and maintain his competence. All his continuing education is in his one comfort area of forensic custody evaluations. He's not gaining any uh, training or experience in family systems and delusional thought disorders and factitious disorders in personality disorders and attachment pathology. In all the relevant domains of pathology, I'm not seeing he's taking ongoing efforts to develop competence in those necessary domains. Google ignorance, lack of knowledge or information. Um, so I'm when I, I say these forensic psychologists are ignorant, that's not like a personal criticism, that's the English language. Uh, they're ignorant by definition of the English language. They lack knowledge or information about attachment, family systems, complex trauma, factitious disorder, delusional thought disorders. They lack knowledge or information. They're ignorant about all those things. Ignorant opinions have no value. So if Dr. Childress needs to explain the pathology to you, you're ignorant. And I'm having to explain and educate you before I can have a professional level discussion with you. If you're ignorant and I have to educate you, you need to leave. You need to leave the family courts, go learn what the pathology is, and then come back. You need to come over here competent. It's not up to me to teach you. It's up to you to already know. That's boundary 2.01. It's up to you to already know. Standard 2.03. It's not up to me to teach you, nor is it up to the patients to teach you. You should not have your patients teaching you about the pathology. If you have your patients teaching you about what a delusion is or how to assess or diagnose it, uh, you're not competent by definition if your patient's teaching you about it. So you need to go away, get competent, and come back. Indolence, avoidance of activity or exertion, laziness. I will assert that all the forensic psychologists are simply lazy, too lazy to learn the established knowledge, so they give themselves permission to just make stuff up. Resist, refuse, dynamic, parental alienation. They just make stuff up because they're too indolent. They're too lazy to... Um, learn real knowledge. It's too much effort. Um, so it's easier to just make stuff up. Um, I'm worried about 9.01, basis for assessment. They're doing an evaluation assessment. Psychologists base the opinions contained in their recommendations, reports, and diagnostic or evaluative statements 
including forensic testimony, they're talking to forensic psychologists, on information and techniques sufficient to substantiate their findings. See also standard 2.04, basis for scientific. So if they're not applying the knowledge of attachment, family systems, delusional thought disorder, DSM-5, uh, personality disorders, complex trauma, and child abuse, if they're not applying that knowledge, then they're in violation of standard 9.01 as well. They're, they're recommendations and their forensic testimony, their diagnostic evaluative statements are not based on information and techniques sufficient to substantiate their findings. I'm looking at four potential ethical violations, 2.01, 2.03, 2.04, 9.01. Standard 1.05 says if I'm worried about any ethical violation, I've got obligations. And standard 1.04 says I have to informally take steps, but the APA gave it two ethical standards, our responsibility in responding to potential ethical violations by other psychologists. That's how serious the APA takes self-monitoring. That it gave, it didn't put one standard with two parts. It gave it two full standards. It says, first, handle it informally. Don't rush, rush to your licensing board. See if you can help the person self-correct on their, their errors. Um, but if an apparent ethical violation has substantially harmed or is likely to substantially harm a person or organization and is not appropriate for informal resolution under 1.04 um, or is not resolved properly in that fashion, psychologists take further action appropriate to the situation. So substantially harmed in the past, yes, I think that criteria is met. Potential for substantial harm going forward, yes. I'll cite to the Blue Ribbon Commission, dangerous, uh, harmful to children, uh, lack scientific and legal value, um, and that critique. So yeah, I think that clause is met. Um, and then it's not appropriate for informal resolution because it's all the forensic custody about, it's all of them. It's everybody who Dr. Stahl and Simon have been teaching about this is doing exactly the same thing. And so I can't go around individually doing that. If I run across them, then 1.04 is active. But it, it's not appropriate for um, resol it's not appropriate for resolution under 1.04 and is not properly resolved in that fashion. I've told the AFCC at their national convention about the ethical, um, ethical requirements for competence. I've submitted a petition to the APA signed by 20,000 parents. I got you know my website and my YouTubes. I'm telling everybody. I've written a book about it. So I'm doing everything about informing them, but they're not motivated to solve the pathology. And so the psycho the the issues, the ethical issues, are about competence or have not been properly resolved by notifying the forensic psychologist. So now I'm required to take further action appropriate to the situation. Part of that further action is what I'm doing here. I'm empowering parents to acquire competence by how to read a professional VITA, how to organize what's important in the VITA and what's just kind of fluff, superfluous stuff, um, helping family law attorneys know how to read a VITA, cross-examine mental health testimony so that they can serve their clients better in getting appropriate services for their clients. Um, and so that this, what I'm doing right now, is part of taking further action appropriate to the situation. Um, and then, you know, I, can, I suppose, take other action appropriate to the situation. The uh, American Psychological Association gives some guidance on that. They say such action might include referral to state or national committees on professional ethics, just uh, send a petition to the APA to the, you know, about the problems, the APA ignores it. Because, and here's my interpretation, because the forensic psychologists are in key positions of power and they are disabling the mental health response to the pathology in the family courts for their own financial benefit. That's my um, analysis of the situation. There are forensic psychologists in key positions who are disabling the mental health response to the pathology in the family courts for their own financial gain. Once we get the, the, the forensic psychologists eliminated, as was recommended by the New York Blue Ribbon Commission, once we eliminate the forensic psychologist from professional psychology, the mental health system then can, will then become active and can respond appropriately to the pathology in the family courts. Clinical psychology needs to return. They haven't been here in 40 years. The clinical psychologist is not competent. 
it's too dangerous to work in the family courts. We need to make it safe in the family courts so that Dr. Childers doesn't have to put his license at risk to be able to help these children and families. Um, we need a standardized diagnostic assessment protocol. You can listen to me and do mine, or you can come up with one on your own pilot program, but we need to solve the pathology. I have ethical obligations. Um, they are mandatory. There's reasons for the ethics code of the APA. I can tell you why there's reasons for 1.04 and 1.05. It's to address exactly this issue. Okay, Because I'm a psychologist. I know what we should be doing as psychologists. You guys don't. The family law attorneys and parents, you don't know the obligations of psychologists. Psychologists do. Okay, So that's why we have 1.04 and 1.05. We monitor our own because it's the right thing to do and because it solves this kind of pathology or this kind of difficulty where you have unethical practice that's harming clients and, and people in the general public. We got to do something. We, we're not allowed to just walk away and not do anything. So uh, with that, I'm just going to close up on the Blue Ribbon Commission again. So you've seen uh, Dr. Stahl's Vita, I consider it very thin. He does one thing, forensic custody evaluations. Blue Ribbon Commission independent review has determined that what he does and teaches other people to do are, is of dubious validity, that it produces defective reports with potentially disastrous consequences to parents and children, that it's harmful to children, that it lacks scientific or legal value, that it's dangerous, and the practice is beyond reform. It's not me saying it. It's the Blue Ribbon Commission. It's also me saying it from actually having read what they write their actual reports. I am in full agreement with the um, Blue Ribbon Commission here. And so just returning back to where I started with this American you know, board certified in forensic psychology and these boards that certify these forensic psychologists as being something special or as having some sort of special advanced expertise. As a clinical psychologist, I'm not even sure they're competent in the pathology. So if this is the product these, these boards certify as having advanced expertise that don't even reach the level of APA ethics code competence, um, I question the quality of being a diplomat in an American you know, forensic psychology board certified forensic psychologist. And so I question the value of that if they're dubious validity and harmful to children, then that's what they're doing. So with that, um, I'm going to wrap up my analysis and review of Dr. Stahl's Vita. Uh, again, I'm willing to debate the issues with any forensic psychologist anytime. Um, so the role of forensic and clinical psychology in the family courts, I'll represent for clinical psychology and say we need to get rid of forensic psychology and uh, clinical needs to return. The clinical mindset, for Stahl and Simon disagree with the clinical mindset and then they say we need a forensic mindset, clinical is not approach, so they can present their case and how their forensic custody evaluations have been a solution for the past 40 years. And we can present that and everybody can hear it online, moderated debate, everybody can hear it, everybody can make their own decisions and we can have an informed decision about how to proceed. So I'm in uh, for professional level debate, find a forensic psychologist who will defend what they do. And so with that, I'm going to head off and uh, good